and I will not let you down. Ready? Yeah. Oh, that felt good. Was that sexy? That's that felt great. sexy. We'll, we'll Photoshop it. Well, the reviews for last night's GOP debate are in, and it seems as if most people think that Ron DeSantis shit the bed. I'd agree, and also Donald Trump seems to agree as well, writing this on Truth Social about DeSanctimonious' performance. Quote, DeSanctimonious was a bomb tonight, especially with his softball interview with Sean Hannity, which is kind of a jab at Sean Hannity, too. This guy has totally forgotten his past. Who cares? Now he followed up by sharing tweets of DeSantis promoting the COVID-19 vaccine that he's now against. He shared this bizarre photo of DeSantis wearing a mask, which I've got to admit is human. He also shared articles of DeSantis' COVID-19 record and his support for lockdowns. And I'm assuming that Trump specifically shared those things because DeSantis last night took an indirect shot at him for not firing Anthony Fauci. Now, Trump, in this instance, is correct to point out DeSantis' hypocrisy, even if Trump is the most hypocritical person in all of politics, because DeSantis actually was pro-vaccine before it became politically expedient for him to attack the COVID vaccine. In fact, he actually let his donors jump the line in Florida before he turned into a full-blown anti-vax kook himself. And it's interesting that he's running on his COVID-19 record when his policies resulted in tens of thousands of unnecessary deaths. So interesting choice there by DeSantis. But aside from that, I do agree with Trump that DeSantis bombed. And it's clear that the more time he spends in the spotlight, the worse he does. Because there was that awkward smile that he did last night that went viral that you saw at the beginning of this video. But I mean, even before that, Matt Binder pointed out that his sociopathic facial expressions look exactly like Homelanders, which I think is hilarious and accurate. But the debate was basically his chance to show people that he has a personality but unfortunately, that didn't happen. He just talked louder, and I guess that that's like what he believes shows people is his personality. And on top of that, he looked very indecisive in a couple of moments. So in one instance, he uh, called discussions about Trump and his conviction or potential conviction all a distraction and said that America really wanted to move on. And to me, that really felt disingenuous, right? It, it felt like he was desperately trying to move on because the subject made him uncomfortable because it's hard to navigate that when you know Trump is guilty, but the base doesn't want to hear you say that. And so he just looked really awkward in that moment. And when the moderators asked uh, the candidates whether or not they would support Trump, even if he's convicted, DeSantis didn't initially raise his hand. But after looking around to see what the other candidates were doing, then he decided to reluctantly raise his hand himself. Please raise your hand if you would. I don't know what to do, but I mean, I guess Vivek is raising his hand, so I will too. I mean, this is embarrassing. You are running to be the president of the United States. Have you not previously thought about this? Did you not think that this question would come up? Have you not thought of the Trump question? I just, I don't get it. So, I mean, he came off to me as so inauthentic. And my conclusion is that not only did he lose the debate, but it's clear to me that he is the Republican equivalent of Hillary Clinton, who just feels overly, overly rehearsed, focus group driven. And I commented on this last night, too, but he was wearing too much makeup. I mean, he looked plastic, which isn't necessarily helpful when you're trying to convince voters that you're a real person and not a fucking alien wearing human skin. So I think that he is by far and away the biggest loser of the night. And it seems like a post debate voter panel seems to agree as well, who didn't really respond very very well to him. Here's what I want to ask you about who you thought did the best during this debate. Basically, who do you think won the debate? I'm going to do it in alphabetical order to be fair. Anyone think Doug Burgum did the best? That's zero. Anyone think Chris Christie did the best? He certainly got most of the airtime. A lot of the airtime, not most of the airtime. How about Ron DeSantis? How many of you think Ron DeSantis did the best? That's two people. How about Nikki Haley? One, two, three, four people. Asa Hutchinson? Mike Pence? Zero. Vivek Ramaswamy? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Tim Scott? Okay, so this panel here thinks Ramaswamy won the debate. So just two people thought that DeSantis won the debate. And that's bad because this was make or break for him, in my opinion. He needed to prove to people that he has what it takes to be the front runner to Donald Trump, the answer to Donald Trump. 
and he shit the bed, right? He just he just doesn't have it. But interestingly enough, seven people raised their hands for Ramaswamy, and they think that he won. And I get that this is very subjective, but a candidate might appear to be the winner if, one, they get a lot of talk time, and two, if they appear confident. And I think that Ramaswamy checks both of those boxes. So when you look at talk time, with the exception of Mike Pence, Ramaswamy actually got the most talk time, and he got a minute more talk time than DeSantis, which says something. And he also seemed to be Trump's favorite during the debate because Trump actually thanked him on Truth Social for sufficiently licking his boots, I guess. And he called his answer about Trump's criminality a, quote, big win. And Trump also pointed out that Chris Christie was booed during that exchange with Vivek, where he tried to be honest about Trump and the fact that he is a criminal. He has broken the law, and that's pretty obvious. But look at how the audience responded to Chris Christie in that moment. In an answer, you sit here in an answer right now. Hold on one second. You sit here in an answer. Go ahead, Hold Governor on. Christie. Hold Go on, ahead. Governor Christie. Hold on. Well, so listen. The more time we spend doing this, the less time they can talk about issues you want to talk about. So let's just get through this section. Governor Christie. Yeah. So very, very embarrassing for Fox News's audience and the GOP's base. But I mean, that clip makes it pretty clear why Trump likes him. And I think that Ramaswamy did make a really strong first impression. Uh, he clearly knows his lane. He is presenting himself as the right wing populist. And I think that there's a chance that he might get a boost after the debate, especially since Trump is championing him. The problem, however, is that I think that he's too much of an online candidate and he's very clearly pandering to the online right wing grifter spear. And I don't know that that's going to translate into real votes. Right. Furthermore, I say that there's a chance that he might get a boost because there was some really damaging moments from last night's debate for him. For example, he seemingly plagiarized Barack Obama. And if that wasn't bad enough, he got called out for it by Chris Christie in real time. Who the heck is this skinny guy with a funny last name and what the heck is he doing in the middle of this debate stage? I'll tell you, I'm not a politician, Brett. You're right about that. The hope of a mill worker's son who dares to defy the odds. The hope of a skinny kid with a funny name who believes that America has a place for him too. in one of these debates, Brett, who stood in the middle of the stage and said, what's a skinny guy with an odd last name doing up here was Barack Obama. And I'm afraid we're dealing with the same type of amateur standing in stage tonight. That is embarrassing. It's one thing to have people point that out later after the debate takes place. But to get called out on it in real time is much more embarrassing. And the response to Chris Christie was, uh, oh, well, you hugged him. Gotcha. You just got caught copying Obama. I think that that's much more damaging to your credibility than Chris Christie fucking hugging him during a hurricane, right? But it gets much worse for Vivek because as the youngest person on that stage, you would think that he'd have the most reasonable response to the climate change question, which I'm surprised that they even asked, by the way. Uh, and when I say reasonable, comparatively speaking, right, because these are all Republicans, so they're going to say something ridiculous. Uh, but just in terms of him compared to other Republicans, you would think that he would have the most reasonable response to appeal to younger conservative voters who are also con concerned about climate change. But he had the worst response by far. Let us be honest as Republicans. I'm the only person on the stage who isn't bought and paid for, so I can say this. The climate change oh, whoa, agenda whoa, whoa, whoa. is a That's hoax. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. The climate this change agenda is a hoax. Is and we have to declare independence for it. And the reality is, the anti-carbon agenda is the wet blanket on our economy. And so the reality is, more people are dying of bad climate change policies than they are of actual climate change. Governor. That was by far the worst answer I've ever seen on climate change. But I am happy to see that the right-wing crowd there actually booed him for calling climate change a hoax. Are we making progress? Maybe a little bit. Is it too late? Possibly. But... Progress is progress, right? And that moment seemingly did hurt him because as Navigator Research reports, as Vivek Ramaswamy called climate change a hoax, our independent dial participants' attitudes dropped across the board, particularly among young women. So last night during the leftist mafia, I said that I felt like Vivek started off really strong, but then started to go downhill, particularly at that moment. And it seems like voters 
agree with me, right? And really just calling climate change a hoax, the way that he said that was so fundamentally idiotic because take a moment to think about this. He said that he can call climate change a hoax because he's not bought and paid for him. In other words, he doesn't even have to take money from the fossil fuel industry to show for them. How is that compelling? Doesn't that make you the biggest rube on that stage? Because, I mean, as bad as it is to take money from the fossil fuel industry, you can at least understand why someone like Mike Pence, for example, would advocate for fracking and fossil fuel extraction because he's being bankrolled by them. But your excuse is that you're going to show for them because you're not taking their money it just doesn't make sense and it came off as very disingenuous and the reason why it came off that way is because he's lying and i say that because here's what he said about climate change not that long ago in fact during the same campaign that he's running right now climate change is also real by the way i talk about the climatism piece of this when i talk about climatism and covidism i'm not denying the underlying reality of covid mm -hmm. i'm not denying the under reality of the underlying reality that global surface temperatures are going up and in part due to human activity but what I'm denying here and rejecting is the religious fanaticism to say that that needs to be the end all be all purpose of human action. I'm not discounting important questions like how and whether we combat climate change and when and what time frame we do it. But those are questions in which every citizen has an equal stake and an equal voice where someone cloistered in a corner office of Manhattan should not dictate the way an entire industry behaves, settling that question through force rather than through debate interesting even if he's not bought and paid for as he says he sounds like someone who has been captured by the industry now as someone who is extremely online and who's trying to pander to the right-wing grifters like tim pull and stephen crowder i mean if you're online if you're a terminally online candidate do you not understand how easy it is for us to look up your previous interviews and see that you're contradicting him yourself here I mean, if you want to come across as the authentic candidate and you're saying all the establishment candidates on stage are just conservative NPCs, then why would you yourself say something that makes you look like a hypocrite? I mean, it's just it's insane. But here's the thing about this debate. It felt pointless, right? The whole thing was seemingly completely meaningless because all of those candidates on the stage are nowhere close to Donald Trump in the polls. If you take all of their numbers and you add them together, they still don't even come close to Donald Trump, right? And at this point in time, he's on track to easily win the GOP nomination, but Trump didn't show up to the debate. However, his son did show up and threw a tantrum in the spin room because they wouldn't let him in, or I should say he threw a tantrum outside of the spin room, but nonetheless, here's what he had to say. Right now, trying to ban people from actually having discourse about politics. Uh, How un probably, probably shouldn't surprise any of us. Uh, but that's what it is. I've been told by others that I would be able to go in. So they said we were able to go in, then they said they weren't, now that we're here. Wait, wait, saying, and the candidate that said you can't go in the spin room. They're telling me right He's now, Fox, Fox won't let that. me into the spin but room. That's what the American people Fox should know. News, this is the kind of They're telling they him, are. he works for security here, but they're telling him that I'm not allowed to go in there. Because the candidates that they've been boosting while simultaneously trying to cut down Trump for the last, what, two years, didn't perform as they had hoped. So they can have someone who can maybe be a representative of my father. Just like a few weeks ago when I was canceled after the first indictment, I was scheduled to go on. And about five minutes before I'm on, I found out I'm no longer on because apparently I wouldn't be a great surrogate to talk about my father's indictment. Just so we understand what we're dealing with here. So it shouldn't surprise any of us. And it's also why Trump was 100 percent right to not go to this debate. Exactly. It's beneath him. And when you know that you're walking into a setup because of exactly these kinds of circumstances, you understand exactly what's going on in mainstream media, even conservative. I'm sorry, but why exactly do you need to be in the spin room? Because you won the lucky sperm club and you're the president's son. I don't I don't get it. I don't get why he made such a big deal about this. And to be clear, I don't think it's a big deal if he were to be let in, right? I think they probably should have allowed him in. But the entitlement here that's on display is just astounding to me. And what matters more, I think, arguably, is the interview with Trump and Tucker Carlson since he is leading, right? So the debate itself in the grand scheme of things is less consequential. So I don't understand why Trump Jr. was so hell-bent on getting in. But either way, I do want to shift gears a little bit because I think that the debate wasn't as important as that interview with Tucker Carlson because Trump is the leading candidate. So what he says matters and that debate in my opinion was nothing more than a bunch of people auditioning to be trump's vp but if you watch that interview then you will see that 
we are doomed if this person does indeed become president again, because the interview itself was just so Orwellian. And it's not like that's out of the norm for a Trump interview, but just listening to him lie again and again and again for 45 minutes about the election, I mean, and just deny basic empirical reality. It's just, it's so disheartening. And he talks about the charges and he tries to conflate his election denialism and attempt to steal the election to Hillary Clinton's response to losing in 2016. But notice how he's going to blatantly contradict himself as he tries to make this point. The attorney general or the uh, district attorney, Fannie, Fannie Willis, in Atlanta, she's getting killed. Basically, she's saying Trump doesn't have the right to, uh, to criticize an election. But you've been around long enough now. You've seen many elections criticized. I mean, Hillary Clinton goes crazy. Every time she talks, she says, he's not the president, Jimmy Carter said. He's not the president. Well, I am the president. Hillary Clinton called me, by the way, at 3.02 in the morning to congratulate me the night of the election. And that right there is the fucking difference, Donald Trump. As insufferable as Hillary Clinton is, she conceded immediately Whereas you did not, you declared victory and then tried to illegally overthrow the U.S. government, okay? But he's claiming that this is a First Amendment issue and it's just insanely disingenuous, right? If you get busted for soliciting prostitution, you don't get to cry First Amendment, right? If you try to bribe a police officer and they arrest you and charge you for that, you don't get to cry First Amendment. Well, you know, it's my First Amendment right to try to charge a police officer or to try to bribe a police officer. That's not the way that this works. And he knows that, but he's lying. As dumb as Trump is, he's smart enough to realize that what he's saying is complete bullshit. This is not a First Amendment issue. And what he did is much different than what Hillary Clinton did in simply complaining about losing the election and blaming Comey and Russia and all these other things. He tried to steal the election. And another thing, the way that he said Fannie Willis is getting killed there, that to me, that really sent a chill down my spine. It felt very ominous. Like it felt like he was trying to instigate violence against her in a way. But I mean, we all know that he lives in an alternate reality. And that is a problem in and of itself, right? He can be deluded. And as a person who could be in a position of immense power, that's a problem. But the bigger problem, in my opinion, is the fact that his supporters have chosen to live in this deluded false reality with him. And that's what makes this moment much more dangerous. So let's look at one more clip where Tucker Carlson is going to interestingly ask him about Jeffrey Epstein, which is awkward. And Trump is going to be very uncomfortable for obvious reasons during this portion. But let's watch. Do you think Epstein killed himself sincerely? I don't know. I, I will say that, you know, he was a fixture in Palm Beach. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what Barr said about it either. I have no idea what he said. What did he say? He killed himself, probably? He said he killed way. himself and that they were going to do this investigation. They never did the investigation. It's never been yeah. public. Well, and they hit it. And like, why are they doing that? He and clearly do Barr knew. But why would Bill Barr be covering up the death of Jeffrey Epstein? Uh, Bill Barr didn't do an investigation on the election fraud either, okay? He said he did, and he pretended he did, but he didn't... Uh, but he didn't do the job there. Uh, I don't know what he did with Epstein, but possibly he did Do didn't you think do it's that. possible that Epstein was killed? Oh, sure, it's possible. I, I mean, I don't really believe, I think he probably uh, committed suicide. He had a life with, you know, beautiful homes and beautiful everything. And he, uh, all of a sudden he's incarcerated and not doing very well. I would say that he did, but there are those people, there are many people, I think you're one of them, right? But a lot of people think that he, uh, he was killed. He knew a lot on a lot of people. He was killed. You I think, think so? I think the more, the closer you look, I'm not a conspiracy person at all. I believe everything I hear. Uh, but yeah, the, the closer you look into it, I mean, the Attorney General of the United States, your Attorney General, yeah. clearly lied about the Epstein death. Yeah, and he was, why? he was, uh, certainly it wasn't well done. They had no cameras, they had no anything, everybody was sleeping, and you know, there, the a case could be made, look. <laughs> I'm not going to get involved in it, but I can tell you a case could be made either way. Very interesting how Trump tried to change the subject there at the beginning, isn't it? Now, Trump was a friend and associate to Jeffrey Epstein. He was on the flight logs. But here's what I mean when I say that his supporters are living in a false reality with him. This person tweets, Trump got indicted before anyone on Epstein's client list. Let that sink in. Now, it got 5,000 likes, but the reply from Anonymous correcting them saying he was literally on Epstein's list and then provided them with proof only got 250 likes. 
that to me is frustrating because we are living in an era in American politics where the truth literally has no bearing on people's opinions at all. And that's really scary because if you can't bring these people back to reality with the truth, then you can't bring them back, period. So, I mean, after watching the GOP debate and then Trump's interview afterwards, I can't help but feel a little bit, I don't know what the right word is, distraught, overwhelmed, because the Republican Party, it's clear, is one of the biggest threats in the world to human life. And I mean that. That's not hyperbole. Their sole purpose at this point is to inflict as much pain and suffering on people as possible, all while racking up as much money and power as they can. Politics to them is not a form of service. It's all about self-aggrandizement, and that's it, right? And that's that's sad. But what makes it more sad is that the moderate candidates today, like Chris Christie, Mike Pence, Nikki Haley, they were the most extreme candidates just 10 years ago. So, I mean, at the rate that this party is devolving, how long until we look back at the Trump era and see Trump as one of the more moderate Republicans? It's a really scary thought, right? There was a time where we all thought that Sarah Palin was the worst that the Republican Party can produce, and now she's just kind of a normal Republican, right? The extent to which they have shifted the Overton window is shocking. The way that they all talked about immigration on the debate stage was something that took a lot of people off guard because that was how Trump talked about it back in 2016 when he talked about deporting everyone. But now that's just what they say. So, I mean, the conclusion is that this party must, absolutely must be kept out of power in order for our country to even have a chance at surviving. Vagina. <laughs> 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 <laughs>